What's going on everybody, it's your boy Big Mike, and I'm back with another video. Today we're going to be watching a video where this man ranks every first round quarterback's current situation with the teams that they were drafted to in this year's draft. If you guys want to watch the original video, link's in the description down below. With that being said, let's get this video going. All right, let's see what's the going on The 2024 NFL Draft was insane. Six quarterbacks were selected in the top 12 each landing in unique places that have their pros and cons. Now, the truth for these guys is the number one, the number one con for me that I really, really looked at the most is Michael Penix getting drafted by the Atlanta Falcons. I, I realize the Falcons are looking for the future, and I realize Kirk Cousins is just coming off of an injury, but it's like you you just paid the man. You gave him a four-year contract. It kind of, when you make that pick, no matter what team you are, if you offer a four-year, I think it was like $180 million contract to a quarterback, and you decide to take a rookie quarterback in the first round with a top 10 pick, that means that you either have no faith in the quarterback that you just signed or you you just have no faith in the quarterback you just signed. I Like I said, I do realize Kirk Cousins is coming off of an injury, but I, without even telling Kirk that you're going to draft him with the general manager getting confused about the draft pick, it's like that's not really a good thing to do to your own team is it's often just as much about where you land as it is how talented you are so in today's video i want to investigate each first round rookie quarterback situation and rank it on a tier list i'm gonna very very quickly without even saying a lot about it i'm gonna do my ranks from best to worst uh caleb williams number one um, I would have to say Jaden Daniels at two. I'm going to put JJ McCarthy at three. Might get a little bit of controversy for that, but I'll explain it like later on in the video. Um, four, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put Michael Penix. Like, I realize I just went on this little rant about how I don't think it was the right move for the Falcons to draft this man, but I, I'm going to have to put Michael Penix at four. Um, at five, I'm going to put Drake May. Um, the Patriots really need help still at that wide receiving position. Um, so I'll have to see how Drake May does. And then Bo Nix, I'm going to put him at six. Sean Payton should have never been the head coach for the Denver Broncos. They have nobody to help him out. Um, their offensive line is ass. Their receiving core is equally as ass. And Sean Payton himself is an asinine head coach. Now, the draft That's all I have to set say an all-time record for draft attendance, with over 700,000 people attending over the course of the three Jesus days. Christ. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of it, courtesy of today's video sponsor, SeatGeek and the Arizona Cardinals. SeatGeek is the official ticketing partner of the Arizona Cardinals. They hope if you are an Arizona Cardinals fan, I, I apologize. Um, you're never going to win a Super Bowl. Hook me up with some free gear, including this KTO Cardinals jersey, which was sick. And for the event itself, there was a ton of activities to keep us busy. We even got to tour backstage. And for the draft itself, That's cool. we were lucky enough to be sitting in the draft theater and witness the action up close. I even ran into Ray Finkel. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. I have no there are idea more than 70,000 uh, events Ray every Finkel single day is. on SeatGeek, including concerts, sports, festivals, and more. There's going to be awesome things to do on a regular basis, and you don't want to miss out. They put all the tickets across the web into one place to make sure you are getting a good deal. Each ticket is rated on a scale from 1 to 10, so look for the green dots. Green means good and red means bad. Every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And you know I came through for you guys. Use my code KTO for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. And thanks again to SeatGeek and the Arizona Cardinals. As far as number one overall picks go, 
this is about as favorable as it gets. Normally, the team picking here was atrocious the previous season, but the Bears were a 7-win team last year with the major concern really being at quarterback. The roster had some promising pieces in 2023, which will still be a part of the team in 2024, including wide receiver DJ Moore and tight end Cole Komet, who both proved extremely effective in the past game. And throughout this offseason, the Bears have really bolstered this offense with multiple weapons including veteran Keenan Allen, running back DeAndre Swift, tight end Gerald Everett, and wide receiver Rome Adunze. I, I feel like Rome Adunze can be a really good addition for the Bears. Um, in my personal opinion, I think it was really a good pick, but I feel like the Bears could have still worked, at least on the defense. Um, Keenan Allen, he is a veteran receiver. He He's fallen off a bit and i feel like fans of keenan allen uh are either gonna disagree with me or hate me maybe they'll be 50 50 i don't even know um and then really quick i'm just gonna say this um i am not a fan of caleb williams mainly because of his attitude um i'm not taking away the talent that this man has but his attitude and his cockiness it just sucks overall it's terrible who they used their other first round pick on. Also, they added depth to the offensive line, which should be at least average if they can stay healthy in 2024. I can now on the flip side, that. it is Chicago. They have struggled offensively for most of their modern history. But yep. with that said, Caleb is easily one of the most talented quarterbacks this organization has ever had. Also, things do change, and I like this situation a lot. The team hired offensive coordinator Shane Waldron, who proved himself to be able to revive Geno Smith in Seattle. Factoring in a favorable offensive situation alongside Caleb's outstanding talent, I'll give his situation an A tier. Honestly, this might be the best situation a number one overall quarterback has had that I could remember. I can agree with that mainly because of the weapons that he's going to have in Chicago, and I agree with what this man said about um, Chicago's offensive line. A it could be good, it could be bad. Chicago's offensive line really hasn't gotten to a great level. So we'll have to see how this offensive line does. With the number two overall pick, Washington fans are seeing 2012 deja vu with Jaden Daniels. As Washington is not that bad of a situation for being the second pick. However, it's not as impressive as Chicago. Last season, they struggled offensively and saw most of the coaching staff get fired. Austin Eckler is probably going to be a good running back for this team. I just wanted to throw that out there. The team hired defensive-minded Dan Quinn as the head coach and brought in Cliff Kingsbury That's a good as hire. offensive coordinator, and which that is will be a good a fit good for Jamie Daniels. Outside of Terry McLaurin, their weapons offensively are average. They and brought I in Austin agree with Eckler that. and Zach Ertz, which are decent, but are not huge splash signings by any means. This team will be somewhat of a wild card, since their offense will look so much different going from that West Coast style with Sam Howell to an air raid RPO style with Jaden Daniels. But one of the biggest issues this team will have is figuring out how they're going to manage on the offensive line. At the end of 2023, the Commanders had one of the worst O-lines in the league, and they cut their best offensive linemen in the offseason. With no clear answer at left tackle for now, they project yeah. as one of the worst O-lines entering 2024, which... I'm actually not really surprised about that. I'm really not. And it kind of sucks that, you know, Jaden Daniels is going to have to be in that situation. But going back to the Austin Eckler comment, I think Austin Eckler can actually help with that too because he's an elusive running back. Um, he's strong. He's fast. He can do good. Um, but once again, with this offensive line that Washington is going to have for Jaden Daniels, I don't really have faith in that, especially when they're going to play against the Cowboys two times a year. Um, the Cowboys have one of the best defenses in the NFL, aside from the fact, in my opinion, that Micah Parsons is the most overrated defensive lineman in the NFL, and he is just as delusional, if not more delusional, as all you Cowboys fans out there. I'm just saying which spells disaster for a rookie quarterback. I like Daniels the player, but I think this first I year might be tough considering the O-line and the average pieces around him. So this situation lands in C tier. I can, I can agree with that. With the third overall pick, the new era Patriots selected Drake May. 
the most prototypical quarterback of the class considering his size and arm talent. Honestly, I feel bad for May. He's perhaps the most raw of these first round quarterbacks and needing the time to learn. Yet, he's going to the worst situation of all the quarterbacks and will probably start day one. There's just hardly anything positive to say about this situation. They were arguably the worst offense last season, and they didn't add any pieces in free agency that make you go, wow, this team looks... And that is the, what he just said right here. That is the prime reason why at the beginning of the video I said that I think J.J. McCarthy's situation in Minnesota is better than Drake May's here because, you know, J.J. McCarthy has Justin Jefferson, um, Jordan Addison. The Patriots have washed up receivers. They don't have a guy like Addison. They don't have a guy like um, Justin Jefferson. And uh, I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this, but I think the tight end for Minnesota is... Um, uh, I, you know what? I don't even remember. I had it at the top of my head and it went away. Point of the matter is, the wide receiving core for the Patriots is the main reason why I put J.J. McCarthy over Drake May. So much better. Their best receivers entering 2024 are Kendrick Bourne, who had 400 yards last year, and second round rookie Jalen Polk, who might be good, but is a rookie. With a first time head coach taking over the Patriots, hardly any weapons that have proven to be good, and worst of all, an offensive line that doesn't project well entering 2024, there is gonna be some serious growing pains. They do have Jacoby Brissett, and hopefully he can somewhat shoulder the load during this rough transition period, but- The Patriots are gonna finish last in their division. I'm just gonna get that out of the way. I think Miami is gonna finish first, Buffalo second, Jets third, uh, and then Patriots are going to finish last. I wouldn't be surprised if the Patriots had another top five pick going into next uh, 2025's draft. Either way, Drake May's situation D. goes in Exactly. Detail. I 110% agree with that. The 2024 NFL draft, the this... Falcons select Michael wow. Jr. Well, there it is. Wow. Wow. That, I, once again... Like I said at the beginning of the video, just wow, my reaction was the exact same. I thought Atlanta was going to go into this pick and boost their defense. I thought that's what they were going to do, and they didn't do it, which, I again, I'll never understand the pick up until, like, we'll have to see, you know, what, uh, what uh, Kirk Cousins does this upcoming season like if he's falling off do they put michael penix in that spot i i don't agree with this pick the situation he's going he's not even going into a good situation mainly because he's not even going to be the number one quarterback when the falcons selected penix jr everyone was shocked after yep. signing kirk cousins to a four-year deal in free agency and parading him around town the Falcons went ahead and drafted another quarterback in the top 10. There will be some awkward team dynamics considering the relationship between Cousins and the front office, but this video's purpose is to analyze the situation for Penix himself. Out of all the first round quarterbacks, Penix will probably sit the longest unless an injury yep. takes place. Although he has been described as one of the most plug and play guys because of experience, it's not a bad thing in the NFL to sit for a year and learn the ropes from a veteran. Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, and Jordan Love are great examples of this playing out effectively. This seems like one of the most yeah. sound strategies in terms of building up a young quarterback, but we just see the impatience set in too often and guys are thrust into the starting role. The worry here is that with a new coaching staff, including a first-time head coach and first-time offensive coordinator, you just don't know what you're going to get. They could have a whole new staff by the time Penix plays, but as of right now, Atlanta has some nice offensive pieces in a weak division, including Drake London, Bijan Robinson, new signee Daryl Mooney, and... With what he just said, I personally feel like the Atlanta Falcons are going to win the NFC South. That's, again, that's my opinion. Perhaps the revival of Kyle Pitts with a better quarterback under center. Plus, they project to have a top five offensive line entering 2024. So if Penix does see the field, it's a hugely favorable situation. This one's a bit of an unknown, but assuming Penix sits at least a year, I will give this situation. 
I'm not going to give it a B. I'll probably put it... I, I would probably put Michael Penix at C. Once again, only because it's like... He's going into a good situation with the weapons that are surrounding him. But with the fact that he could sit for a year, two years, maybe even three years... It's like... Uh, and when I did my mock draft, when I was doing mock drafts, I always had Michael Penix falling to, like, mid-first round, like, late first round as well. Um, but that's what I was doing. I don't think he's a B. I'm going to have to put him at C. A B tier. J.J. McCarthy couldn't have asked for a better situation. Minnesota is the most stable organization offensively out it of is. all these teams that picked a quarterback. Considering Kevin O'Connell has been the head coach for years and is seen as a promising young head coach. And also their offensive coordinator has been there the past two years. Stability does wonders for a franchise. This offense has been built for Kirk Cousins, which is great for a guy like McCarthy. He doesn't have the same ceiling as the other quarterbacks, but shows promise as a game manager type, which really isn't a bad thing in the NFL. Plus, McCarthy will have incredible weapons, including the best receiver in the league, Justin Jefferson, a solid number two, Jordan Addison, and an amazing receiving tight end, TJ Hawkinson. From That's what I was trying to think of, because I think Hawkinson started out with Detroit, but it, like offensively, I think J.J. McCarthy is going into the best situation of the NFL. Now, I know I put him, I believe I put him at three when I was doing, like, best to worst, but then it just, like, popped in my head. So I would say J.J. McCarthy is probably at one when it comes to the best situation for all of these quarterbacks. Last season. Also, they signed running back Aaron Jones and did bring in a veteran quarterback in San that was actually really confusing to me not them signing aaron jones but what uh the packers did because if i remember correctly and i might get this wrong the packers uh offered aaron jones a contract or they either re-signed him then they brought in uh josh jacobs and then I think they released Aaron Jones. They didn't trade him. Like, the whole thing was just confusing to me, and it still is. I don't even remember exactly what happened. Sam Darnold, so they can always start with him first and work in McCarthy whenever they feel it's time. Also, they have a projected top 10 offensive line. So, that honestly, can help as well. it doesn't get much more favorable than this. I don't think he'll be the best quarterback of the bunch, but he certainly has the best and most stable situation. So I'm going to put his situation. Who do you think the best quarterback is going to be uh, out of these quarterbacks on the screen right now? Not based off of like the situation they're going into. Based off of like their talent, their skill set. Who you think is going to be the best quarterback no matter the situation. In my personal opinion, I... It, it's not even just based off of the situation. It's based off of his talent. I think Caleb Williams is probably going to be the best quarterback out of all of these guys. Once again, I don't like him. His attitude sucks. His cockiness sucks. But I'm not going to take away the talent that Caleb Williams actually has. In S tier. This last one's interesting. It's the one I'm most unsure about. Nix was the least desired of the top six, but those yeah. who defended him comped him to Drew Brees for his decision making and short area accuracy. Obviously, anytime well, and that's probably why Sean Payton, you know, wanted you're compared to a Hall of Famer, Nicks. you're set up to fail. But not talking about the level of play and more about the style of play, and you get what Sean Payton likes in a quarterback, a guy who can take the snap, make his read, and get the ball out quickly. Obviously, the difference was that Drew Brees had multiple pro seasons under his belt when he joined forces with Peyton, whereas yep. Nix is a rookie. I think Denver does have some good pieces offensively. Also, I believe this roster will be one of the weaker ones of the six for the next few years, yeah, considering how much they're same. eating in the dead cap because of Russell. That was probably the dumbest thing that you could ever do. I sat here when the Broncos originally got Russell Wilson, and then before he even played a snap for that team, they offered him the contract that he, that he did. I think it was a, 
I believe I might be wrong. I think it was a six-year contract, but I might actually be wrong on that. I was not a fan of that contract offer because Russell Wilson had never played a snap with the Broncos. And then the first two seasons that he played with Denver, like he literally proved why I said that was the dumbest move that the Broncos could have ever made. So Wilson, they will have an average offensive line and their offensive weapons are promising, but they won't be the most spectacular offense in the world. Because Sean Payton has proven his ability to elevate quarterbacks, Knicks is in good hands. I just feel like there will be at least some growing pains in year one. I'll put his situation in B. I wouldn't put him at B. I would put him at C. Only because of the fact that, you know, uh, the offensive line isn't as good as Atlanta's offensive line is, number one. Number two, um, Sean Payton's a dick. He's just an asshole. He's a terrible coach. He's not a terrible coach. He is a good coach with a terrible mindset, terrible personality, and he's just a dick. E -tier. Play action and Boats Knicks taking the deep shot for Johnson. How about that? Brothers, touchdown. So that is the end of the video, and I'm actually going to go back to the end rank here. I'm going to pause it right here. So um, this list, I, I agree with the majority of this list. Like I said, Bo Nix, I would move him down from B to C over the simple fact that the Broncos offensive line is not, you know, the same as the Atlanta Falcons offensive line. But that's my opinion. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like. Comment down below what other videos you would like to see. And I will talk to you all later.